Welcome everybody. Welcome to 2019 and the first webinar of the AWRA webinar series. And we're excited to be here today. We've got, uh, as you can see on the screen, we've got four people involved in this. Two will be speaking. Uh, we've got uh, John Matthews from the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation and John Kucharski from the Institute for Water Resources, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. John's based in Davis, California, and also other co-authors on this uh, presentation, Guillermo Mendoza, who's also with the Army Corps of Engineers, IWR, but in um, Alexandria, Virginia, and then Ott Joiken from Deltares, the, uh, the, the Dutch firm that's uh, very well known for, for uh, water work. So let's get going here. And uh, dude, lost the screen again. And how to participate um, in this webinar. And as you can see there, we do take question and answer, and we'll be doing that uh, about the last 15 minutes of the webinar. And uh, you can open up the question box on the, you should see a little dashboard on the right side of your screen. And if you click the, if it's a plus sign or an arrow, if you click it next to the question tab, um, then that'll open up a little screen and you can type in your message or your question and then it'll come to me and Christine McCrayan and we will then relay it to John or John whichever one you specify at the end of the um, presentation so you ask the questions through us uh, please try to be succinct and if you have a question for a specific John whether it's John Matthews or John Kucharski John M or John K if you can indicate that now um, if you're registered for this, and you probably all are, although some are probably watching on another computer, uh, you will get within 10 or so days a message telling you where the webinar recording and the PowerPoints shown as PDFs are archived. They'll be in a Dropbox. You will need to have a Dropbox account, which is free, to access the recording and the PowerPoint. So you'll be able to see everything at your leisure and view it again and again and again and all that kind of stuff. So here's our uh, schedule, Eastern Standard Time in the US. Uh, John Matthews is in Slovenia. John Kucharski's uh, just down the road from me in Davis, California. Um, about in a few minutes, they'll be actually starting the presentation. And then at about 15 minutes towards the hour, of uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, both John will be uh, John K and John M will be available for uh, questions. We want to thank our friends at Stantec Consulting for uh, the support. They provide the template that we use, and without them and uh, Lisa Butler, our president, who is an employee of Stantec, and actually this is her personal template, uh, we wouldn't be able to do this. So a little bit of information. There's a picture of John Matthews. He's all dressed up and ready to go. Coordinator and co-founder of the Alliance for Global Water Ap Adaptation, Agua, which is based right here in Corvallis, just a few miles from me. Um, John Kucharski is a senior economist at IWR with the Corps of Engineers located, um, I assume, at the Hydrologic Engineering Center in Davis, California. So John's going to be talking about some economic issues and, and, a, and a U.S. case study. Um, also, the, the co-authors on this presentation, Guillermo Mendoza, who's um, at uh, IWR, but in Alexandria, Virginia. He's the one in the red there showing all the people. Something's going on on his screen. And then a co-author is Odd Joiken, who's um, with uh, Deltades in Netherlands, and he'll be unable to be on the talk, but of course he contributed to the um, information and the research that went into producing this webinar. So um, Christine is holding down the fort in Middleburg, Virginia. She's the controller and can cut us off if we get rowdy. I don't think she'll do that. That's her high school graduation picture. And that's me uh, doing what I do best is pointing to someone and looking stern. So anyway, uh, a couple of things. We're still assembling the schedule for 2019. If you have an idea for a topic and or a speaker, let me know. Send me an email at aquadoc at awra.org. And even if you don't have a speaker, but if you would like to see us cover something you think is a timely issue and will would be very attractive to our listenership, please let me know. And if you also have a speaker who could do that, that's fine. We, we want to hear from you. So jot that email down. A couple of things. We've got uh, two more coming up. Um, next month, we do these every month about the middle of the month. We've got Jennifer Veyu and Shlomi Dinar from Florida International University, just about uh, three weeks from today, talking about a global analysis of water-related terrorism. And, and that that's 
going to prove to be a real uh, fascinating one. Jennifer and Shlomi are, are really top-notch people who have been involved in these things. And then in March, uh, Todd Votler, who's president of Collaborative Water Resolution, LLC, will be talking about my favorite aquifer, Texas's Edwards Aquifer Dispute, how a water market resolved the collision between the Endangered Species Act, groundwater law, and private property rights. And Todd was in the thick of this thing from the beginning, so um, you know he's really got the goods on what, what went down there. A couple of uh, conferences we want to promote, our spring conference is coming up in a couple months, just about two months from now, in Omaha, Nebraska. And this one is talking about, it's our third specialty conference on Integrated Water Resources Management, or IWRM. The program is now available. You've got that long URL there, but if you just go to awa.org and look under events and networking, you'll see the conference listed there and you can see what the online program looks like. So please take a look at that. And our second conference, our summer specialty conference will be improving water infrastructure through resilient adaptation. So it's related to today's talk. That's gonna be in Sparks, Nevada. Now, if you don't know where Sparks is, um, it's just east of Reno, right there on uh, just off Interstate 80, cuts it in half. And so it's easy to get to. It'll be at the Nugget Casino. And if you've ever been to the Reno Sparks area, you know that the Nugget has its own exit off the um, interstate. Anyway, the uh, abstracts are due tw uh, February 25th, about a month from now. You can use that long URL there or just go to awra.org, click on events and networking, and you'll see the conference listed there. So that's about it. I'm all done. So what we're going to do now is we are going to turn it over to John Matthews, and he's going to start the show. John, it's all yours. Thanks a lot, Michael. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to give this talk. I'm really proud to be speaking with uh, my colleague, Don Kucharski. I'm sorry that my uh, friends and colleagues, uh, Guillermo Mendoza and Ott Yerkin, uh, can't join us. But um, if you have uh, additional questions, they, they might be interesting people to follow up with as well. Uh, today's uh, talk has a, what I hope is a slightly provocative title, at least a, a curious one, Keeping the Baby in the Bathwater. And the idea here is uh, there have been a lot of efforts over the past 15 or 20 years to think about climate adaptation and water resources management. And many of them have started with the assumption that we really need to treat this as a climate science problem, that uh, uh, that climate science will come in and it will provide us the necessary information uh, to really be able to uh, uh, create resilient uh, water resources management designs, operation plans, and, and so on. And what I'd like to uh, argue here <clears throat> is that uh, resilient water management is still a water problem, and climate science has something to contribute, but, but we actually really need to keep all of the information that we've accrued over many decades uh, of, of insights and, and, and build on it, not, not take away from it. I'd like to uh, just provide a very quick introduction uh, to my organization, AGWA. It may be familiar, unfamiliar uh, to many of you. Uh, uh, we are a, a network that's about eight and a half years old. Uh, around 1,400 people globally uh, are in the network. Uh, we're uh, largely water and climate professionals across the full range of, uh, of the water uh, disciplines. So uh, I happen to be an aquatic ecologist by training. Um, uh, uh, Guillermo is an engineer, Ad Yurkin is a climate scientist, John Kucharski is an economist. We also have lots of uh, governance people, uh, for instance, uh, uh, hydrologists and so on. Um, so we, we really try to cover the full span of disciplines that are involved uh, in many of the different types of institutions that are in, uh, involved in water decision making. And we're really joined by this insight that, uh, that climate change represents some fundamental challenges to how uh, we try to manage water in a sustainable way over decades and even centuries. I'd like to begin with uh, a, a quote that I think is also somewhat provocative. Um, I, this, this is a quote that I heard in, in person just about two years ago at a, uh, a small, mostly internal meeting uh, at the World Bank. Uh, and this is a, uh, the global water practice at the World Bank is massive. It's really hard to imagine how large large it is, it's somewhere between 20 and 30 billion annually. And 
this senior manager, uh, you know, he's responsible for a lot of this portfolio. He, he stood up and he said, we build things that last 300 years. Why don't we think about sustainability for that long? Uh, I would argue that we actually have a, a real challenge in, in thinking about the sustainability of our water management plans uh, even more than over a 10 or 20 year period. We, we, once we go to the, to the time scale uh, of the operational lifetimes that we're building or managing or the ecosystems uh, that we're managing, which presumably have an even larger uh, operational lifetime, then climate change becomes a, a really profound driver uh, and one that is not easy to include with the other drivers that we're often um, uh, more immediately concerned with. And this is especially true because of the kind of modern synthesis, the modern uh, worldview that we live in, in terms of water resources management. Uh, on the right is the cover of a book that was published uh, as something uh, that was called the Harvard Water Project, which lasted until around 1961, 1962. Many people are not familiar with the wa Harvard Water Project. Uh, I uh, own a, a, a copy I was able to purchase on Amazon uh, that was an old library copy. Uh, and I, I was fascinated to uh, look in the back and see that it had never been checked out from the university that it came from. The, uh, the, the, the Harvard Water Project really combined engineers, uh, hydrologists, and, and uh, economists uh, to develop a, a kind of a stepwise, a uh, comprehensive approach to optimizing uh, water resources uh, based on a kind of joint evaluation from all of those uh, d disciplines. It was a very sophisticated approach for its time. It gathered together many decades of previous uh, insights and it has gone to fixation. It is, the, it is fully the worldview that, that we all live in. At the same time, it, it, uh, uh, it explicitly states uh, uh, that um, it is trying to look for the single best design for any physical environment. And also, there is a, uh, a clear statement in the book that says that we are assuming that climate is fixed. We know that's not a, a true assumption, uh, but, but it makes everything a lot easier uh, if we assume that the climate is fixed. And that really began to become undone uh, across many members of the water community starting around 2008 with a science policy forum a piece that was led by a million colleagues called Stationarity is Dead. And the, this, this idea that, that the past really is not of an effective uh, predictor for the future anymore. And we have huge uncertainties that we don't have an adequate way to really be able to address. So in effect, the problem is that, that we have uh, a framework that is strongly uh, quantitative in, in how it, it focuses on our decision making uh, and highly optimized. Uh, but climate change uh, uh, presents really new uncertainties that, that are, are difficult to reconcile with uh, other kinds of uncertainties that we felt relatively confident about. So it reduces our confidence in, in that quantitative framework. Um, and the challenge for us as members of the water community is how to be responsible. Uh, the ecosystems that we're interacting with, the infrastructure that we're operating and designing, uh, they really have a low tolerance for failure, uh, especially with the kinds of stakeholders that, that, uh, that we're, we are responsible to. The top-down era of, uh, of uh, uh, optimizing water resources management is, is still um, a present globally. Uh, it's a uh, a, a method that really begins with a decision maker, very often a, a man uh, who defines the problem or the need uh, that's handed off to some type of a technical analyst, someone more or less living in the world of uh, economics and engineering in that language. Uh, they might do a climate vulnerability assessment. There's often not necessarily a, a kind of fixed or standard way to do that. A single solution is developed effectively one vision of the future. And then this is handed off to users and stakeholders. But as all of us uh, uh, here know, uh, it's really not just the climate that is, uh, is non-stationary, that, that the past doesn't really predict anymore. Demography is also uh, going through strange transformations. Urbanization patterns are also shifting in many areas. And clearly political systems, political trends uh, are another kind of major contentious area that we need to think of as a, as a kind of additional non-stationarity.
So how do we reconcile all of these perspectives and often the, uh, the resulting uh, uh, unease that users and stakeholders uh, feel with this process? We really need to kind of flip this process around. Uh, we need to think about how that technical analyst can work with the users and stakeholders to become a kind of midwife or translator of, of their vision, their objectives, uh, that can be translated in, into a uh, problem or need with input from a decision maker, um, but really driven by those users and stakeholders, then that technical analyst uh, uh, develops a variety, uh, almost a portfolio of, of solutions that then uh, can be judged by what it is that we know about, what we feel confident about in, in terms of uh, the, the climate that we may be entering. It, it, uh, that will be judged uh, by also by the criteria um, uh, chosen, the performance indicators chosen by the users and stakeholders, and the decision maker will ultimately make the final selection and uh, may choose uh, one, uh, uh, one one solution, may choose actually several and order them uh, into some type of a staged uh, a set of uh, interventions, and often using a completely different set of final criteria. Uh, than uh, was used in the past, such as uh, uh, maybe political buy-in. This contrast between top-down and bottom-up is is really significant, and I, I would say that it's one of the uh, megatrends that we're seeing across the water community. And, uh, many people uh, are familiar with it. Many of them are wading into it in their in their work. Very few institutions have have gone uh, uh, to fully implement this, but. It, uh, the one of the implicit assumptions that if we open up the decision making process, maybe we can come up with a, a broader vision of what the problems and needs are, uh, and uh, we will bring in uh, more ideas with more perspectives and hopefully also have a more effective implementation in the end. Bottom up decision support systems are still relatively new. Uh, in the water community. Uh, the, the two that I uh, am most familiar with that I think uh, have been, uh, have received the most attention in, in my mind, uh, beginning in 2015 on the left, the, uh, is the decision tree framework. This was published by the World Bank, Confronting Climate Uncertainty and Water Resources Planning and Project Design. It was led by Patrick Ray at the University of Cincinnati uh, and Casey Brown at UMass Amherst. Uh, that is designed to help the loan officers at the World Bank uh, identify with their clients in, in, uh, globally uh, the imp implicit and explicit uh, climate risks and then find some way to uh, reduce or avoid uh, those, those threats. I'm going to spend, and John Kucharski uh, uh, will uh, chime in too, uh, on, on this a newer methodology, which came out formally last October. Uh, it's called uh, CRIDA or CRIDA, Climate Risk Informed Decision Analysis. So uh, who, what's the who, what, and why of, uh, of CRIDA? Our audience is that technical analyst uh, that I was describing earlier. Someone who's technically trained, who lives in this engineering, economics, Harvard Water Project world. Uh, and, and they, they may not be an engineer, they may not be an economist, but that's still the language uh, that, they, that they need to use. The need is, in most cases, uh, really powerful. Uh, what, what I've heard, I've been working in this space since around 2003, 2004, what I hear over and over again in every country that I've worked in is we need some kind of a structured, pragmatic approach that's tolerant for limited data, uh, and, and tolerant as well to limited capacity. Uh, when we were developing CRIDA, we often started our workshops with a simple statement that we're uh, trying to work with a technical analyst uh, who may not have anything more powerful than Microsoft Excel on their desk. And they probably have very limited uh, uh, institutional support that they're working in. Can this work in Rwanda? Can it work in Nepal? If it'll work there, then it'll work in the US, it'll work in Europe. Uh, uh, and it, it'll be a, a really robust approach, but let's go for the really hard part first. The institutional limits are often very critical uh, too. Uh, it's uh, in most cases existing decision-making frameworks heavily discount most of the adaptation interventions that we can think of. 
they're too distant or there's too much uncertainty. Uh, so how is it that we, we think about making sure that they actually, uh, if we come up with a good idea uh, for a credible threat, that it makes it through the decision-making process and actually uh, uh, becomes something uh, that, that's visible and on the ground. And for that, we, we assumed that we need a stepwise process, something that was modular, and it was also really key to existing decision-making processes. And our ultimate goal is not for some type of a boutique approach, uh, but it's to deeply institutionalize this methodology so that we come up with consistently robust and flexible outcomes that are not independent on the predilections of any uh, particular individual uh, that, that's, that's doing the work. What are the elements of CRIDA? Uh, uh, as, I, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, this is, this is a, a UNESCO International Hydrological Program uh, uh, a project and pro program uh, globally now. That's the logo in the top left. It really begins with a shared vision that I talked about earlier with the stakeholder and decision maker needs being very clearly articulated that the analysts then uh, translate these into specific performance indicators that uh, can be related to, uh, to climate change, to climate variables. These are confronted uh, with stress tests and then our definition of resilience in CRIDA uh, is very explicit and it has two components. First, we assume that you need to be robust. That is, with credible information that we have about future climate, uh, how do we make sure that we're addressing the full range uh, of, of credible climate variables uh, and impacts? So the reasonably comprehensive to credible threats. And we use a methodology there called decision scaling. But there's a huge amount of residual uncertainty, especially when we begin to think out uh, past a decade or two. Uh, and all of that residual uncertainty is, uh, is, is not something that we can ignore. We have to incorporate it. And that's where the idea of flexibility is really critical. And we use here a methodology called adaptation pathways. Across the bottom, you see the logos of the uh, primary groups that have contributed here. IC Warm is a, the, the US UNESCO group that's uh, led by the Institute of Water Resources, Deltatis. The Rijkswaterstaat is the Dutch uh, Water and Infrastructure Ministry, a very old ministry in the Netherlands, and the Hydro Systems Research Group uh, at UMass Amherst. Uh, and in practice, we also think that it's very critical that we think about uh, the larger eco hydrological landscape. And so we need to bring in ecosystems into this process. So nature based solutions are actually really important. Uh, to consider uh, and to make sure that they sit on the table. And they're especially important when we think about flexibility and, and strategies to deal with deep uncertainty. Uh, Nature-based solutions are often uh, most suited uh, as a set of flexible uh, uh, ideas. Uh, performance indicators, uh, very classic kind of engineering uh, idea, uh, well established as a concept in the water community. There are uh, certain critical thresholds that we need to make sure that we maintain or we don't don't exceed. Uh, uh, we develop a broad strategy uh, that's based on uh, our sense of the assets that may be at risk and the degree of uncertainty that we're facing. I'll go into that in a little more detail later. Uh, and then decision scaling is a very powerful way also of communicating uh, the, the need for robustness. Here is a risk surface map. Uh, uh, John will talk a little bit more about that later. That's a way to communicate success and failure, essentially. And all the little hatch marks there, that's from a ton of climate model outputs. So it actually gives you some sense of the credible operating space in which you are working as a water manager, where you need to steer out of that red zone and that blue zone. And adaptation pathways is, uh, if you haven't kind of run across it before, it's definitely something that's worth investigating on its own. It's a methodology that uh, its inventor, Marjolein Hosno, a Dutch uh, researcher, uh, calls the metro map. And, and her idea there is that we need to navigate solutions uh, through time and make sure that we don't end up uh, in, uh, in decision boxes, that we get trapped uh, where it's really hard to reverse or impossible to reverse bad decisions. So we, 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 can, we can maximize flexibility if that's necessary. Selecting a strategy is something that's really important. Uh, uh, John will go into that in uh, more detail too. But here the idea of thinking about future risk and analytical uncertainty, this is a really, it's not 
uh, so much a risk assessment approach is it's a risk tolerance approach. What is it that you feel comfortable with that you can live with? And if you uh, sense that there's low future risk based on on your uh, uh, on on uh, your available data, your uh, the models that you're pulling in, the analytical analytical uncertainty is pretty low. Then I say do uh, you're in quadrant one. Do what you're going to do anyway. That is probably going to be quite sufficient. Climate change is probably not your biggest driver, our second biggest driver. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, uh, but if uh, you feel really strongly about, about uh, the, 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 the types of impacts that you may be facing, you have a very low tolerance for failure, and you're pretty certain about what those impacts are, then you're in quadrant two. You need to pursue a robust strategy. Uh, if you're in quadrant three, that's where you have a lot of analytical uncertainty. You don't feel comfortable uh, in saying uh, with confidence what the future is going to look like, but you think that those impacts may be relatively modest, then you probably want to defer a lot of decisions so that you're able to see how conditions evolve over time. But in truth, if you're building a big project, uh, a, a project that has a very low tolerance for failure, and there's uh, even a medium amount of uncertainty, then you're probably in quadrant four. And that's where you need a robust and flexible strategy. The implementing partners and places uh, are quite widespread. Uh, CRIDA has been in development for uh, almost eight years. Uh, uh, and in that time, it's, it, by my count, it's been applied somewhere between uh, in 12 and 14 countries. And I can think of three other countries that, it, uh, that in the next uh, three or four months uh, it'll be started in. This is a, a, a global um, movement really and uh, the, the countries that it's been applied in range from Sweden to Thailand, uh, to, uh, uh, Zambia to, uh, 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 to, to Mexico. It's, it's a remarkable diversity uh, and, and different types of applications too. For instance, uh, at, uh, in South Africa it's been applied uh, to develop uh, some of the national policy framework for freshwater climate adaptation and thinking about how risks are identified and trade-offs are negotiated from a, a, through a policy framework. We've also worked at the level of specific utilities. One of the most interesting projects and largest projects is, a, is in the Dniester River in Eastern Europe, uh, which spans Ukraine and Moldova. There's a, a big and increasing flood problem there. This is funded by the Global Environment Facility in the order of around 20 or 30 million euros. Uh, and, and involves both governments, uh, a UN agency, and the US Army Corps of Engineers. Very impressive, large uh, uh, application of, of CRIDA. I, uh, I'm an ecologist by training, and I'm, I've been really intrigued by how we might take these powerful ideas and apply them uh, to ecosystems, because engineers and ecologists, we tend not to agree in very much, but we share a kind of common problem. Engineers have have, uh, as Millie pointed out uh, with the Harvard Water Project, uh, that they've assumed for a long time that the past predicted the future. Ecologists have, have assumed for a long time that the past predicts success, uh, that it defines uh, our, our, our targets and goals as well. And that's a real, uh, real challenge. So there's a team uh, that was supported by the National Science Foundation, the Sysinc Research Center in Annapolis, Maryland. And for about a year and a half, uh, we had a team of engineers and ecologists working together uh, under a CRIDA uh, umbrella to develop something called eco-engineering decision scaling. This is the reference here. We applied it initially uh, 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 on the Coralville Dam in Iowa. And uh, I think it, it demonstrates actually the kind of broader uh, implications of the CRIDA approach. There's a status quo uh, set of solutions. That's uh, the, the two columns. Each, each row represents a different approach. Status quo, existing management, uh, and then three different hypotheses, uh, uh, different types of, of interventions. And uh, the first one is, is really uh, an operational one. Second one is, is, is changing the infrastructure. And the third one is combining those two approaches. The first column is thinking about the, uh, the infrastructure uh, operating limits. Uh, and the, the second column is about the ecological operating limits and their, their performance uh, indicators. And the last column is how we try to find 
we, we maximize the joint space. This is not using ecosystem services. No one is assigned to monetary value here. If you're just trying to find the shared common space and all those little red and yellow dots there, they represent uh, a, a massive number of, of climate projections. They give us some sense about what a credible future might look like. In this case, uh, uh, hypothesis one and hypothesis three are probably the ones that uh, are most likely uh, uh, to be successful. And we will probably choose that as the decision maker, uh, ultimately based on maybe some other uh, criteria, such as the, the, the cost or, or political impact uh, of, of one or the other. And we can use uh, uh, other variables as well, such as the natural flow regime, and, and, and begin to apply additional uh, layers. We've actually applied this general framework uh, at, at a national level in Mexico. Uh, we did that with the Inter-American Development Bank, with the Mexican National Water Commission, Conagua, and WWF Mexico, with a lot of the technical work being performed by uh, a UNESCO team based in Chile. And this is a very powerful approach looking at environmental flows, of all things, uh, across 300 basins that has become uh, national policy in, in how we think of environmental flows regimes as a kind of tool for climate adaptation that helps set uh, a, an environmental reserve program uh, 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 for, uh, for the whole of the country. Uh, and it does this by identifying the performance limits of ecosystems. In this particular basin, it was focused on ecological drought. So as you're a water manager, you want to steer on the right side uh, of that figure. And this has been published uh, by UNESCO and uh, WWF. Uh, uh, that, that's my uh, uh, last substantive slide. I just want to uh, provide some credits for uh, my, my colleagues uh, located in many countries. And, and thank you for your, your kind attention. Uh, we have a podcast that is uh, on climate adaptation. It's called Climate Ready that we do at, at Agua. And we have uh, one episode that is actually on the Mexican case study. And we have another episode uh, from our, our, our last season that also talks more specifically about CRIDA in particular, if you would like to hear some additional voices. And with that, I will hand it over to John Kucharski. Thanks, uh, John Matthews, and um, also Michael for that introduction. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit about um, evaluation and selection of climate adaptation plans. Uh, I'll briefly introduce a US case study that I'm managing on the Tuolumne River Basin in California as well. Um, okay, so, um, uh, earlier along in the creator, creator process, some of the early steps um, have us identifying our project's climate-related vulnerabilities and formulating a set of possible adaptation plans um, to mitigate against those vulnerabilities. The obvious next question then for us is uh, which plan should we select? So I'll argue that uh, sometimes a clear winner will emerge, but usually an incremental analysis is helpful. Uh, so we'll start with our climate response surface, which is an output, um, a typical output from that uh, earlier sort of climate-related vulnerability assessment. Um, so here we have changes in precipitation on the horizontal or x-axis and changes in temperature on the vertical or y-axis. So that each gray dot in that plot um, uh, that you're seeing on your screen represents a different climate scenario um, from our bottom-up vulnerability assessment. And then the vulnerability underneath of each one of these scenarios is given by the color that's plotted underneath the gray dot. So we have a, a set of red scenarios, which are mostly hotter, drier scenarios, which represent losses in performance for us, and a set of green uh, scenarios, which are mostly cooler, wetter conditions, uh, which lead to an increase in performance. Um, and then we have a set of uh, blue and red circles here, which might represent a set of uh, GCMs uh, in this particular case, which um, the, 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 the case here doesn't really matter very much, but uh, I'm using a sort of a simple hydropower example uh, to drive some of these points. Um, it's helpful to group these scenarios together based first on vulnerability. So we, uh, as I mentioned a second ago, we have a set of um, cooler, wetter scenarios, which lead to an increase in performance. Um, and then we can start to think about grouping uh, together some scenarios also by likelihood. So we see sort of a cluster of GCMs, those blue circles, uh, there, which represent um, a relatively modest amount of climate change um, uh, and low vulnerabilities. Um, so we might call that a most likely low vulnerability set of scenarios. 
Uh, to the left of these, we have a set of scenarios which represent hotter, drier uh, scenarios. Um, there's not a lot of GCMs in this particular area. We have to pass through this most likely set of conditions in order to arrive at these, uh, this more stressful, hotter feature state. And so we might call these uh, a less likely uh, set of conditions that we still want to worry about because they're beyond some sort of uh, critical, threshold, uh, critical threshold or failure point for our particular project. Uh, finally, we have a set of outlier scenarios, uh, which may be resolvable, or they may just require more investment in the search for planet B. Um, the idea behind all of this uh, uh, is that uh, these scenarios uh, and, the, and the losses and performance that they induce uh, provide us with a bit of a design criteria for adaptation planning. So um, we can think about those uh, yellow scenarios um, or our most likely set of scenarios as being a set of scenarios that require a maximum um, addition of 100 megawatts of capacity uh, for power generation. Um, and we uh, know that uh, we need to develop plans that mitigate against that particular loss. Um, we can create and optimize strategies um, dealing with each of these different grouping scenarios. So we, set, we develop a set of adaptation plans for this mo most likely low vulnerability set of scenarios. We develop a separate set of adaptation strategies which provide us with the additional robustness required to sort of meet our commitments underneath the less likely uh, beyond threshold set of scenarios and, and maybe even a set uh, to deal with the outlier, uh, very extreme sort of hotter, drier conditions uh, represented by the red scenarios. Generally speaking, um, uh, what's gonna happen is, is that the plans which are optimized for our, um, our um, smaller, uh, uh, or less stressful set of uh, scenarios are going to be ineffective um, underneath of more extreme scenarios. Um, and our really big plans, which are the ones that are optimized uh, for conditions like the sort of red outlier set of scenarios, are going to be too expensive to be practical under less extreme, a less extreme set of scenarios. Um, this highlights the importance of flexibility and adaptation planning uh, so that um, Rather than sort of trying to, uh, as John alluded to, rather than trying to develop a, an adaptation strategy, which is going to deal with all the projected climate change between now and, you know, let's say the end of 2200 or something like that, we try to break up our uh, adaptation plan into a set of more discrete actions, uh, flexible actions, uh, where we focus on building robustness towards nearer term, more certain futures. Um, Occasionally, uh, in this process, a clear winner is going to um, emerge. So in this particular case, we're looking at the benefit of different adaptation scenarios. We have this orange plan, which uh, sort of is uh, our best adaptation plan underneath of each of the three different scenarios. Uh, when this is the case, obviously, we just select this. This is just good planning. Um, but otherwise, uh, we evaluate our plans incrementally to do this. Um, consider our adaptation plan for the yellow or most likely set of scenarios. If we um, build it, but find ourselves in that orange set of scenarios. Um, so that orange set of scenarios is um, uh, the uh, less likely set of scenarios. Um, then we stand to lose the difference in performance between the blue and orange bars here. Um, so in this particular way, we can think about um, the adaptation plan uh, that we might develop um, for uh, the yellow scenario as an insurance against the losses that we would experience if we plan and build for a no climate change scenario. Uh, and in the exact same way, the plan for the orange scenario, it then is just insurance against the losses that we would experience if we plan and build for the most likely or yellow set of scenarios. Um, so um, in evaluating uh, these plans, um, we ask ourselves the question is, uh, is the loss that we prevent, um, let's say, by building the, um, the adaptation plans that deals with the less likely or orange set of scenarios, is it um, worth uh, the incremental cost of that particular plan? So the incremental cost here is the difference between uh, sort of the horizontal extent of that blue bar and the horizontal extent of the yellow bar. Um, in this sort of prototypical example, about $1.5 million, we ask ourselves, is that cost worth the um, a level of insurance that we're buying. The level of insurance is going to be that loss in performance, the difference between the height of the orange and the blue bar. And we uh, use the likelihoods that we infer from our vulnerability uh, analysis to help make that decision. Um, if we decide that that orange plan is not worth it, it's not worth that incremental cost, then we stick with the blue bar. If we decide that it is work worth it, 
we just continue um, along to the right side on this incremental analysis plot until we find a plan that we're satisfied with. Um, so uh, that is uh, the thing that I wanted to cover uh, with regard to plan evaluation selection, one of the topics that John asked me to, to chat a bit about. Um, I'll also talk for um, a brief couple of seconds about um, a uh, case study that we're performing here in the United States. Um, so in collaboration with, um, well, the Army Corps of Engineers, that would be me, but also the California Department of Water Resources and some academic partners at Cornell and the University of Cincinnati, we're um, performing a case study in the Tuolumne River Basin of California. So that's a, a river basin where it, with its headwaters in Yosemite Valley that uh, flows down uh, close to sea level. So starting at 14,000 feet up in Yosemite, down close to sea level uh, in the Sa Sacramento Central Valley uh, near the town of Modesto. Um, uh, we're developing a, a set of tools and methods, which is uh, the thing that the academic partners are really helping us with. And the goals of the case study are sort of these four bullet points. So one is to demonstrate the application of CRETA within the context of US agencies, which tend to have relatively, um, I would say, inflexible and rigid sort of policies and rules and requirements uh, about how they go about um, planning for water resource projects, um, to provide a framework for institutionalizing CRETA within those agencies. Uh, we have a set of research and development goals as well. Um, so we're building a weather generator to facilitate continuous simulation so that we can monitor both flood and drought risks under climate change, which I view as being a particularly sort of um, uh, uh, a particularly challenging but also necessary requirement for adapting to climate change. Um, and uh, also we're trying to provide a credible connection between climate change and flooding, which has been a challenge in the past. Um, and uh, the long-term goal is to set, uh, to create a set of regional climate scenarios for the continental United States. Uh, we're hoping to complete the case study towards the end of 2019. Uh, so this is sort of the range of climate change that we're considering. So again, uh, with uh, changes in precipitation on the x-axis and changes in temperature on the y-axis, we have a set of GCM projections over that period of time uh, represented by the crosses. So everything between uh, roughly 15% drier to 25% uh, wetter um, and uh, changes in temperature um, everywhere between uh, a half a degree increase up to four degrees Celsius increase. Um, by treating each one of these GCMs as random variables, we can um, integrate this uh, our typical vulnerability assessment into the risk-based framework that uh, John talked about that's part of the Harvard Water Project and something that places like the Army Corps of Engineers have bought into sort of hook, line, and sinker in their planning process. We can think about the probability of landing at some particular place across time, which is what this blue bubble is showing you. So darker blue colors are sort of a more likely set of scenarios. Uh, lighter blue colors are a set of um, less probable scenarios, at least using sort of the GCMs as a guide. Of course, as I was mentioning with this incremental process that I'm sort of recommending, we use for climate adaptation uh, planning, uh, we don't want to put too much faith in sort of these quantitative uh, assessments of likelihood because climate change is so very uncertain uh, across time. But this just helps us uh, work um, this uh, CRETA approach into the institutional practices of places like California Department of Water Resources and the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, just a couple of uh, these are sort of hot off the presses, some results that I got just last night, uh, but some things that which won't be surprising to some people in um, who have experience working on the West Coast where interannual variability is really extreme and also interseasonal variability is really extreme in precipitation. We see um, a likelihood that we'll see uh, increased flows into our uh, the reservoirs that we're concerned with um, during the winter months. So those months between October and April for us, the sort of rainy season, um, and then uh, an associated decrease in um, flows uh, during the water supply season uh, for those reservoirs. So during the sort of later spring and summer months, uh, we anticipate losing um, several thousand acre feet of, um, of water, which currently feeds um, irrigated and municipal water demands. Um, so those will be some of the challenges that we're looking at solving, um, a sort of very big focus for California Department of Water Resources and solving these um, uh, some of these challenges are developing some very sort of innovative types of adaptation plans like managing groundwater um, aquifers, uh, using flood flows to recharge those groundwater aquifers and some things like that. So those will be 
some of the next steps for us in this analysis on the Tuolumne River Basin. Um, with that, uh, maybe I will uh, turn it back over uh, for questions. Um, thank you very much. John, thanks, wonderful. Thanks to both of you. Um, got a lot of questions to come up. John, John Kay, why don't you leave your slides up on the screen because um, some of the questions may, uh, may refer to them. But let me start with the questions that came in for uh, early on. So John Matthews, these are for, uh, for you. What, what does it mean that an ecosystem has a low tolerance for failure? An ecosystem doesn't have a brain and an ecosystem doesn't care whether it's a desert or a taiga. Well, uh, that, 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 that's right. I don't, I don't mean to um, uh, humanize ecosystems too much, but, uh, but ecosystems also uh, our, our goals for them, our, our, our hopes for them, our sense of uh, how, how we evaluate them, uh, the perspective of success and failure in terms of management uh, is something that, that that can fail. So uh, uh, a river can run dry uh, when we don't want it to, um, uh, or we could lose an, uh, the the presence of uh, a uh, a particular species that we want to have in a place. Those are all very reasonable um, uh, performance indicators uh, for how we might might think about uh, management success for a particular ecosystem, and. Uh, and they're 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 pretty uh, widespread. In the the case of uh, of Mexico, uh, uh, the I mentioned um, ecological drought. Ecological drought is uh, the, the idea that uh, that the ecosystem actually is experiencing such extreme extreme threat that it effectively begins to collapse. That may not mean that a, a, a particular river is actually run dry, but that it's reached such a degree of water stress that you may not be able to actually uh, bring the, the original ecosystem back once you add more water back into the system. Uh, in the, the case of the Coralville uh, uh, Dam, we were actually looking at, 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 a, at a much uh, simpler variable, which is the uh, amount of riparian wetland uh, in, in terms of area and trying to maximize that as a, as a proxy for almost as a kind of umbrella for a wide range of, of ecological processes. So if you are able to maximize uh, wetland extent, then you're um, bringing in a lot of other really positive uh, ecosystem uh, qualities. So does it, okay. hopefully that makes sense. Okay, it makes sense to me, but I didn't ask the question. We'll see. Um, uh, John M., another, another one for you. How does bottom-up decision-making better address uncertainties than top-down? That's, that's a good one. It, it really uh, is, that, that's a fantastic question. Uh, and it, it's essentially who is defining your problem. Uh, and what uh, the, the longstanding model is that we had uh, often a very high level decision maker that's saying we have a, a lack of energy or we need to increase uh, agricultural productivity. Those, those are fair, uh, th those, are, those are not bad goals. They, they in many ways, they served us uh, pretty well. What we often did, though, uh, uh, as we started to bring in a, a, a climate change perspectives, is that we began to merge uh, uh, the uh, the kind of exclusive use of climate model outputs uh, as as helping us define our goals. The, the the very limited number of water variables that climate models produce. Uh, uh, then, in many cases, uh, often against the objections of climate scientists, uh, were used to kind of constrain and define the, the kinds of problems uh, that that uh, uh, that that we could even even think about. And then later, we would try to uh, understand how uh, those impacts might influence our understanding of the system as a whole. Um, a bottom-up approach starts with quite different. Uh, 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 orientation. It really fundamentally tries to understand the, what, how does the system operate now and when does it stop operating? How the stakeholders that are there that are really important to decision making, to implementation, how do they define success and failure? So it, it, in, uh, in most, most people who uh, have been involved in, in water uh, decision making systems, they feel very comfortable with a bottom up approach because it's more in general, how they think uh, uh, about about trying to manage water systems. They know who many, if not most, of the stakeholders are. 
they have a good sense about how to engage with them and, and their sense of success and failure. And, and they, they can take that system level knowledge uh, uh, with, with the stakeholders and, and then they can begin to see, well, where are the conditions that it, it might break down when it, or when it may, we may be able to increase the success for uh, variables that we care about. So it's, it's more familiar, it's much less abstract and in general, it's it's something that I would say success is much easier to achieve because we have a much higher level of confidence. I, I like to think that bottom-up approaches uh, uh, tend to maximize confidence and top-down approaches tend to maximize uncertainty uh, at the same time that they're hiding it. Okay, great. Um, this one should be an easy one. I think I know the answer, but um, someone asked, what was the name of the Dutch researcher doing work on adaptation pathways? Was was that Ott? Uh, no, it's, it, well, Ott is very, uh, he, uh, he's very involved uh, in, in that process. He, but the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the one name that's most associated with adaptation pathways is, is a woman. Uh, in Dutch, you say her name is Marjolein Hosnoot. Uh, and Hosnoot is spelled H-A-A-S-N-O-O-T. Uh, but uh, but uh, her desk is a few meters away from uh, Ott's, and, and they, uh, Ott is, uh, is, uh, is a very well-established expert in that area, too. So, uh, okay. Good. Um, and I, I just wanted to address those who are um, almost 400 of you who are still um, on the line. Um, if you have sp questions about specific slides and getting citations, et cetera, um, let me just repeat that both PowerPoints um, will be converted to PDFs and we will post them. And if you were registered for this webinar and you know not just watching on someone else's screen, you will have access to all the slides that 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 John M. and John K. presented, as well as the Q&A. So all that will be um, uh, accessible. So I, I, I'm not going to ask them to go back to a particular slide so so you can pick off a reference. The, the questions are coming in hot and heavy. Um, here's one, uh, very impressive question mark, a question for either. Considering differences among GCMs, both in assumptions and outputs, how do you consider ensembles or do you choose the appropriate models? This is especially important about precipitation and soil moisture. And that's from Imam Hakiki, if I got your name right. So I don't know who wants to take that. I can, I'll, I can I'll maybe. Start. Uh, well, why don't I start and then I'll hand it off to, to you because I, I suspect we'll give uh, uh, similar but contrasting answers. And th those contrasts sure. may be interesting. Uh, so uh, I... Um, uh, my, my sense is that the uh, GCMs that they, they do they do air temperature really well, but the but uh, but for the water cycle, uh, for the for uh, the kind of quantitative high confidence needs that we ha we tend to have in a lot of, of water management decision making, um, the there's there's so much range of variability across the climate models that uh, and and often don't even uh, provide. Uh, a, like r report in variables that have a lot of meaning for how we're trying to manage water that that they they have s significant limitations and one of the things that I really like about Crida is uh, Crida uh, both are are fine um, is that it, I think of it as a sandbox in the way that uh, programmers talk about a sandbox that it that you can throw lots of different uh, kinds of data in there not just GCMs you can maybe have like your own uh, model uh, data uh, from a completely independent source you don't have to worry about using a whole range of ensembles you can use all of the the full range of 700 something uh, climate model uh, outputs uh, you can use paleo data you can use uh, a uh, lot of, of of different kinds of data. You're not really just uh, looking at, uh, uh, at 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 one uh, single a aspect uh, to thinking about data. The, the The goal is to have confidence, and if that means more data, then go go get it and put it in there. Okay, John John yeah. Kay, do you have any? I do. Um, so I, I think I the, so I think this the so the the general circulation models the GCMs are are really. I mean, they're amazing in so many different ways. Um, but one of the things that they don't do a particularly good job at is help us uh, understand and explore the sort of wide range of vulnerabilities that lead us to failure um, in water resources. 
Uh, so for that reason alone, um, we sort of start from this opposite direction. So we use the GCMs as a guide to understand sort of what the range of scenarios that we want to look like, uh, when we want to look at are, and we use them at the end to understand uh, and inform sort of the likelihood that we might attach to different sets of scenarios that we evaluate. But what we try to do, like sort of with these response surfaces, is look at a range of scenarios which are much broader um, than what we would get if we started with one particular GCM and then tried to downscale it to produce a sp spatial and, and, and um, temporal resolution that, that is appropriate for our particular project. So we sort of approach this at the, at the, at the, from the opposite direction. Of course, like there are GCMs which are better and worse at doing certain things which seem to produce more and less realistic results for particular places and seasons. And um, we don't really like say too much about that in, as part of this CRETA process, other than that, that's part of the body of information that should be considered on the back end when you're trying to think about the likelihood of landing in one of these vulnerability states. Um, yeah, so that's, I think that's uh, the piece that I wanted to add to that. Okay, very good. Okay, and this is for either one of you. Do you consider global markets and social changes? And how do you address global systematic feedbacks? Um, so uh, I'll, I'll try to take that one on too. That's a it's a great question. It's a it's a it's a really complex area um, with a lot of sort of burgeoning research. I think um, I'm thinking a lot about sort of the social cost of carbon work that's being done um, by folks sort of all over the planet, and a couple of the ones that I've been sort of um, interfacing with. Um, there's nothing in this framework to prevent us from doing that, but what we're trying to lay out is really a generalized framework that can be used sort of in any context. Um, I'll say that the case studies that we've focused on um, up to this point have been very sort of water resource project or system specific. Um, and so we probably haven't um, thought about uh, that like whole range of very complex uh, social and economic uh, set of feedbacks and interactions. Uh, that said, there's nothing to prevent us from doing some of those things. And uh, I presented just a couple of months ago at uh, the um, uh, AGU on uh, some reasons why uh, some of those things might uh, cause us to want to uh, evaluate our projects using different discount rates um, if discounting is, is a part of the normal process uh, in your agency for uh, water resource decision making. Um, but I think it's uh, an area that uh, it, it can easily sort of be incorporated into the creative process. I say easily in the sense that there's nothing in CREDA to prevent someone from considering that complex web of interactions, but that complex web of interactions itself can be very difficult to model. Okay. Uh, that, that's right. I would say that the key there is, is that they, you need to have that translation process into, into water and climate variables. So that, that would be the, the, the only kind of structure uh, using the CREDA system. Okay. Uh, John M., here's, here's a follow-up question about the top-down versus bottom-up approach. Uh, how do you determine which approach appears to be more appropriate? Uh, do, wouldn't it depend upon um, the problem of interest, or how do you resolve that, or can you? That, that, it's, a, it's a very, very good question. Uh, I mean, sometimes in some political systems, uh, some political context, uh, you know, you don't have a choice. Uh, uh, and 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 it's it's made for you. You uh, there there are countries where top top down methods are still uh, re required and, and standard. Um, but I think that the the broad trend, the long term direction is is clearly towards bottom up. And and there often there is some kind of a dance that has to occur uh, between top down and bottom up. It often again uh, uh, has to do with the the role of the uh, ultimate decision maker and how how engaged uh, they they may be in the institutional uh, context. Uh, I would also say that that another reason why you might want to uh, uh, be maybe more open minded about bottom up versus top down is if you're in a context where maybe uncertainty isn't that big of a deal and you're 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 not that that worried. You're uh, maybe making a decision where you can tolerate a lot of uncertainty. There are many policy decisions, for instance, in, in which uh, you need fairly general uh, guidelines and, and approaches. We're still going to have top-down approaches. Uh, what I think is more important to understand is when uncertainty is a, is a, is a big issue and 
and and and we and we need to provide a confident uh, quantitative uh, answer. Then that's that's where bottom up approaches really shine. Uh, um, especially if we can really integrate governance and allocation mechanisms into that stakeholder engagement process. Very good. Uh, again, let me just repeat to um, to our viewers um, who are still online. We have still 335 uh, online. Um, all this will be posted in a Dropbox that you will have access to. If you have registered for this, I'm getting questions um, about is this going to be available? Yes, the video and audio will be available as well as copies of the individual um, uh, presentation. So you don't don't need to worry about that. Um, the other thing, um, question here is, what are the main benefits, drawbacks, and differences between CREDA and the World Bank's decision tree framework that John Matthews mentioned? Uh, uh, John K may have a, a, like a different take on it, uh, especially as, a, as an economist. From, from my perspective, part, part of uh, the difference, it, actually, many of the same people uh, were, were involved in uh, in, uh, in in both uh, projects, one one of the significant differences is that we decided to include flexibility as a major uh, outcome. And I would say that uh, we also uh, our, our main emphasis in Creta is is more on this technical uh, analyst, who's probably maybe more of a of a of a water manager or directly involved in kind of water management uh, uh, decision making. Whereas the decision tree framework tends to be more oriented. Uh, towards uh, a, a kind of fi finance de decision making uh, process. So, it, it, where the World Bank is a bank, they, they make loans, and uh, and they're they're trying to assess their risk exposure as well as that of their 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 clients in the process. And I think the real hope with the decision tree framework is that they're able to take uh, that that these clients are able to bring in the decision tree framework into their own uh, systems. Um, so, in that sense, there there is a considerable overlap, especially around the application of, of decision scaling. Do you, if you have a, is that, is that pretty close to your your sense too, uh, John? Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. So, I, my 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 deep hope is that they're very complementary documents. And as uh, John Matthews was saying, like the 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 author list is very similar between the two. I would say that uh, the place that we hope we've added some value and built onto uh, some things is in how you go about, once you identify a vulnerability, how you go about formulating a set of uh, adaptation plans. Um, and then once you've uh, formulated a set of adaptation plans, um, how do you go about sort of evaluating and selecting one? Um, I think our hope is, is that we've added more in that area. And then maybe I would uh, say the one other place that um, uh, I think we, we hope that we've um, been able to sort of expand upon too is uh, how this stuff gets institutionalized in a broad set of contexts. So the decision tree was um, written very much for sort of a World Bank specific context. Creta was written with uh, uh, a different set of water resource agencies in mind, um, not to say that either one of them is not applicable in, in, in any set of context. But yeah, those would be the main differences, I would think. Okay, <clears throat> let me just say we're, we're now one minute past the, the witching hour. Do either of you have a few minutes, like 10 or so minutes, because we can keep going. We don't, um, you know, the place doesn't vaporize at um, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. At least I don't think so. And so um, it's it, it, it's up to you because um, I've still got a few questions to ask, also a lot of comments. I'm also getting a number of comments saying this was great. Thanks a lot. Um, and an interesting comment, <clears throat> and uh, John Weiner, I think I always mispronounce your name, John um, wonders if, if there's any thought of giving like a version of this presentation specifically or a manual written for elected officials. I bet you guys are thinking about that because I'm sure most of the people online here are, are I doubt if there are too many elected officials, but they might want something a little a little easier to to swallow. Is that is that in the works anywhere? Uh, it is actually. Uh, it's it's funny that you asked that. Um, we we did, uh, yeah. do some engagement at at a pretty high level. I mean, uh, often in, in many management institutions, 
uh, you really need permission from someone higher up to be able to undertake this kind of exploration. So uh, uh, one our partners at, at uh, UNESCO in, in Paris and uh, Icy Warm uh, in Alexandria uh, have suggested that, that we probably need some type of a high-level policy brief. We've actually presented this in, in many cases in uh, kind of policy setting. I was at the Poland COP, the UNICCCC mm -hmm. COP, uh, uh, last month, and I, I presented a couple of times uh, along with the decision tree framework um, I, a, a, to a, a number of decision makers. Um, you know, it's. It, I think it, it, you're 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 absolutely right. It needs it needs some translation, and it's not just using large print and uh, prettier pictures. So. <laughs> um, actually, and and John um, Weiner, who who submitted that question, John mentioned that the. Universities Council for Water Resources, UCOWR, actually uh, published in 2015 a manual for um, uh, elected officials on a primer on watershed management. And um, it's an open access journal. If you go to the UCOWR, UCOWR uh, website, you can probably find it there. But that might be a good, um, um, I've seen that, but that, that might be a good template anyway. That'd be something. That's but it's yeah, thanks for that. Okay, let me see the um, ah Tuolumne River Basin study. Um, this is John Kay, obviously. Is there any um, um, examination of the connection of drought to fire risk and the subsequent risk of mudslide, landslides, and water quality impacts from the lost uh, forest cover? It's not something that so it's uh, I'll say straight out. It's not something that we're considering explicitly uh, in this Tuolumne uh, River Basin study, but it is um, an area of research for me on a different project um, here in California as well. And it's also something that uh, some of the people who are uh, intimately involved in the watershed, um, people like SFPUC have brought up to me um, previously as well, the, the impacts of uh, climate change on on just uh, general land cover and and what the impacts of that are on on the water resources that are available to us um, uh, in the Tuolumne. So it's certainly a hot topic area. It's something that I hope to pursue uh, as part of a different R and D effort, but it's not part of this particular case study. Okay, sounds uh, sounds like a webinar brewing there, John. Um, anyway, um, how is Creta different? from shared vision planning, what the Corps of Engineers has, has been using? I guess that's more for John Kay, but I, well, both of you, either. Yeah, so I, 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 oh, go, go, go ahead, ahead. go ahead. It's all right. Um, so I, I guess I was just gonna say that, um, so we talk about shared vision planning explicitly in the CREATA manual. Um, and uh, shared vision planning is, is certainly a part of the stakeholder engagement process uh, the collaborative modeling process uh, that we imagine uh, for the CREDA process. The CREDA process is, is um, so uh, shared vision planning has to do with sort of bringing uh, different groups together who have different interests in water, helping resolve a lot of times uh, different sets of water conflict, helping think about uh, your watershed and your water resources um, within the context of the system in which they actually exist. Um, and that's all stuff that we think is incredibly important for um, uh, Creta as well. Uh, that's, you know, one of the reasons why a big part of my focus has been on sort of developing this framework for continuous simulation so we can look at drought and flood impacts uh, at the same time and understand the feedbacks between them, how flood season operations affect drought operations and vice versa. Um, but uh, Creta wasn't something, or sorry, shear vision planning wasn't something that was built specifically to help resolve uh, deep uncertainties, although it certainly can help do that in some ways. Um, and so, uh, again, we think that there's uh, sort of that they, uh, these should be complementary uh, efforts. So um, certainly um, uh, shear vision planning should help uh, you understand how to uh, organize and facilitate the types of interactions uh, that you need in order to solve a CREDA problem. Uh, but CREDA is going to add an additional layer there to help you deal with uh, deep uncertainties like climate change, uh, but it could also be demographic change and some of those things that uh, John Matthews mentioned. Okay, that's great. Uh, what, what oh, go ahead. What I'll, add, what, what I'll add to that is, uh, you know, we the, the the integration of shared vision planning was also uh, based on part of, of, of of our defined audience of that technical analyst, 
you know, m many of us with a technical background, we, we never got a class, uh, you know, on, on, on stakeholder engagement. It's something we've had to learn. And it's hard. It, it, it's it's uh, that that process of translation. It places a heavy burden uh, on us uh, as as technical people. So how do we do that? And we so we we saw very early that that uh, some people had had talent and others needed more support. Um, and and that's that's why we we place that right at the beginning because we know it's an extra burden that the, that that analyst faces. Okay. And um, Savannah Cooley has a question for John Matthews. Can you expand on what it means to learn from nature? How can we do a better job with this? And there seems to be great opportunity to learn from resilient ecosystems and apply the characteristics into how we steward the resources in managed ecosystems. And she gives examples, drought resilient forests, controlled microclimates there, uh, and soil moisture retention, et cetera. And can these characteristics be translated into managed agriculture? That's like three or four questions there. But I think the main one is how can we learn from nature and how can we do a better job? A, a, a really nice question. Um, I'd say that uh, we need ecosystems for resilience, but also resilient ecosystems, uh, especially in a time of rapid climate change, that's a, a kind, kind of novel for at least the uh, the, the past uh, few tens of thousands of years, we, we, we need uh, to help ecosystems themselves be resilient too. And uh, what I, as, as an ecologist, one of the things that I, uh, I, I ha have tried to uh, bring in with a, the quieter process is the insight that, uh, that the eco-hydrological landscape has multiple stable states that it can exist in. And those are all resilient from the the perspective of the ecosystem, that the uh, and we and we really need to make choices now. Uh, if the past is not that informative anymore, or, or has d diminished enormously in in its uh, ability to to tell us about the future, then that also means the future presents new choices, um, uh, uh, both for that eco hydrological landscape and uh, and and for our own systems and. Uh, and and I, I think one of the, the great lessons that, that we've learned since the Harvard Water Project is that there should have been some biologists uh, that were uh, on that author list uh, back in the in the 60s. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and that, that, that we needed to have them help us understand uh, this, this uh, broader interaction uh, that, that's occurring. Social, ecological resilience is something that's really critical. It's, I would say it's implicit in uh, in, in Crida, um, but I would like to think that it's deeply implicit. Um, it's, 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 it's fully there. You, um, you, you know, I hate to show my age, but I actually remember the Harvard Water Project, okay, or hearing about it. And and John Kay, I believe one of your former colleagues, Gene Stockeve, started out as a grad student in that project and then uh, transferred to Johns Hopkins, if I'm not mistaken. But yeah, that's a... That was something. So um, I've got I've got 10 minutes past the hour. Uh, I think it's probably best to to if we can go another five minutes. I I've got four pages of questions here because I paste them, and so um, l let me get to as many as I can. Um, uh, again, for either of you, how do you see Crida as a tool to be used in other countries, and if so, how to adapt it? That probably could be a mouthful. So. I'll let you, Why don't you, you talk start with that one, John. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. You, you you want me to take it, or you you want to talk about Zambia? Oh no, I think I think you can take it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy uh, I'm happy to take it if 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 you want me to. But but you, I think you have a I have a few case studies where it's been applied. I think you you're a, more aware of the the full body of uh, international case studies. Well, uh, the, one of the things that I um, that I like to say about much of the world uh, is not only uh, uh, do, do they not know um, what, what the future is going to look like in terms of data, um, uh, but but they in many cases they don't actually have data from the past either. And, and the, uh, I I was the one who who would mention these meetings. What about Rwanda? And, and literally the hydrological uh, records in Rwanda were largely wiped out uh, in their civil unrest in the 1990s, and the little bit that's left is 
is on pieces of paper. It's not even uh, 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 in a digital format. And uh, so th these are these are conditions of of really profound uncertainty, not not just about the future, but actually what has happened. And and I would argue in those kinds of conditions uh, that that you need to make a different kind of of decision. Um, you need to to, to make a decision that in many ways is maybe much more conservative uh, than you would uh, in a place with a long hydrological record like Eastern China or or Western Europe, where we have have, have been uh, taking account of things for uh, uh, um, often many centuries. Uh, and so we have some sense of, about uh, trends and broad patterns. So. I feel like the the traditional Harvard Water Project it tends to really overemphasize uh, the sense of of taking whatever past data is is available and acting in a, almost a kind of deterministic way about the kinds of decisions that that, that you need to implement, being overconfident uh, about about the future. Whereas I'd say Crida is really it, it, it in, in many ways it may be uh, uh, going back maybe 500 or a thousand. Uh, or 2,000 years ago in how we managed water, which is we don't know that much about what has happened and we don't know that much about what will happen. So let's be really careful. Let's build things uh, that can be extended or, or grown or, or evolved over time as we learn more about the system and, and, and our communities uh, 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 shift as well. We don't know, it, it's, it's, it's a, to me, it's about humility even. Um, and and, and I, I would say that, that Places like DRC and uh, in, in Vietnam uh, and uh, 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 Par Paraguay, like they 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 deserve resilience too. It, it just because they 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 don't necessarily uh, 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 have that that kind of institutional um, assets uh, that that that, that uh, other countries might. Um. Several people have, have asked a question similar to this next one because, and it gets down to the fact that that uh, not very many of us like change and, uh, you know, we're used to using the old ways and it's like, well, what's good enough was for them was good enough for us. So from the standpoint of working with, with utilities, engineers, planners, et cetera, what are some of your, the lessons learned you could share when you're trying to help people um, mainstream newer methods than what we've been using. Yeah, so um, this has been something that we've thought a lot about um, with Creta. So I, I think that, you know, it, it's really, I think the, the heart of the question gets to sort of the institutionalization process. Um, and um, I guess that my perspective on, on this has um, sort of evolved over time. Uh, to say that there's a, a, a necessary sort of set of conditions that, that need to transpire within an organization to change anything. Uh, so one is, is uh, there needs to be some sort of directive for, for why that change is going to happen. So, you know, in the federal government, a lot of times that happens as a sort of an executive order or something. Or here in California, there's state bills that get passed that say that we need to incorporate climate change specifically into our analysis. Then there's the piece that CREDA deals with sort of very specifically, which is a guiding set of like principles and methods um, that sort of encapsulate how that change can exist within the context of an agency. Um, and then there's uh, a set of other things that I think I spend a lot of my time thinking about just because of the type of position I am in, the types of uh, tools and software and, and methods and things like that that sort of help make uh, whatever that change is um, relevant to what I would call sort of a, a set of non-believers. Like, John and I are in a lot of ways sort of uh, climate adaptation evangelists or something. Um, you know, we we believe that this is like sort of a necessary condition for the world moving forward. But there's a lot of people out there who are like have a different set of concerns, um, which may be equally valid. Um, and for them, it's it's not practical to, to expect that they're going to completely change their way of, of doing things um, overnight to deal with this sort of new threat or challenge. And and so there's that that set of sort of training and, and tools and things like that that, that need to occur. Um, and then there's sort of a, a cultural change that has to happen within an organization so that whatever is being done, which is new, starts to be seen as sort of routine rather than something additional. Um, and, and I think all of that is sort of uh, possible, um, but it, it also has to be sort of carefully orchestrated. Um, 
Uh, John, you probably have some additional thoughts on the topic, I'm sure. Well, I, uh, you know, I have a, a, a I have a story um, that uh, one of the very first meetings we had in Agua about eight years ago when the, we were just thinking about the decision tree framework and uh, and and, and Crida, uh, there was a we, we had a number of excellent, really thoughtful speakers uh, from around the world that were, were talking about the risks that were associated that that climate change presented uh, to uh, water resources management as we knew it, and uh, there was. A, a very uh, well-known uh, engineer from Guatemala who was at the back of the room and he stood up and uh, he he kind of commanded this this gravitas the silence in the room uh, and he said you know the person that I am most worried about is an engineer that tomorrow he is is called upon to deliver a number it's a, a recommendation a plan uh, a, a, a design and he knows it's going to be wrong. He knows it's going to be wrong because he doesn't have the institutional support to actually uh, do the, the the right kind of analysis uh, to explore the kinds of options that are available. And 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 and, uh, and and this is a responsible person. This is someone that that does not feel comfortable actually uh, providing uh, something that may not just be inefficient but may actually have catastrophic or, or, or profoundly negative consequences that in the context of climate change might not even be reversible. So in, in, we actually uh, defined that audience in, in Agua as, as kind of our core group. We called him Luis's engineer after this uh, after this man Luis Garcia. Um, and and I, I think that's probably the people who are on this webinar that they that these are people that they know that climate change is a significant risk they're not sure they have some ideas about uh about how to incorporate uh new insights but they're not really sure how to organize them or integrate them and those institutional elements that that uh john k just mentioned they are all spot on they're exactly right that they, they all need to happen but i think it begins with this recognition that what we're doing now is 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 deeply flawed. Um, yeah. I, I've got a, a number of questions that, that kind of get at things like, is it possible to do, to use CRIDA, I mean, like with small governmental organizations, you know, small municipalities, um, uh, do you need a consultant? Is it possible for you know the existing, say, water management team or water planning team to to use this, or is it kind of beyond that? And um, a number of people also wondered whether this is being done on the East Coast because it seemed um, I'm, I'm not sure where that where that came from, um, and in other countries. I know John's example, John K, was of course the Tuolumne Basin coming off the Sierra Nevada, but um, so. You might just um, um, assuage people's concerns that this is only being done in a small region or in a couple of countries. So, yeah. So on on the on the the region that it's being done in, um, I've been a part of creative processes in Thailand, Vietnam, Zambia, and um, California. Uh, maybe more. I, that's the list that comes to my head immediately. Um, uh, I know that John Matthews has experience in a whole nother set of uh, places as well. Um, and so it, it really has been truly global, I think. Um, so uh, we have not had a specific CRETA pilot, uh, to my knowledge, uh, on the East Coast of the United States. Uh, but we've certainly done it in places that hydrologically look a lot like the East Coast of the United States. And the decision scaling work has certainly been done in lots of places uh, on the East Coast. And so I'd be happy if somebody wanted to follow up, I could point them to uh, a series of those things, uh, a series of those types of uh, uh, case studies. But um, the uh, other piece of that question, which is like sort of what the size of the institution needs to be to support CRETA. Um, again, we've done it for things um, as small as um, a water treatment plant in Zambia. I've been a, a, in, in, uh, involved in, in a creative project that was for a water treatment plant in Zambia where 
the data was extremely poor, the technical capacity of some of the people that we work with, like very bright people, but like not a lot of sort of technical capacity in terms of equipment and uh, information and resources and things like that. So it really is scalable. Uh, on the other hand, I'm doing it in the Tuolumne and I would call that sort of like the Cadillac version of Credo where we're you know, running weather generators and trying to do things underneath of this risk-based framework that the core uses for its decision-making process and stuff. So it's, um, it's, it's a very, very scalable process. I think it's something that you can do um, with almost no resources. Uh, I'd say on the low end, if you're gonna consider climate impacts, it can certainly be done then I think, I think then sort of the cheapest top-down approaches um, uh, because we uh, analyze very explicitly the certainty that we have in our analysis. So the confidence that we have in our own analysis. So as the, you make something sort of cheaper and faster, that confidence goes down, but we recognize that explicitly in our adaptation plans and we sort of plan around that. Um, where, you know, in places where you spend lots of time and money to try to really nail down a really solid answer, uh, that uncertainty diminishes. But um, uh, yeah, I think I think really like regionally and then both like in terms of institutional capacity, it can be done almost anywhere. And we've designed it very, very uh, explicitly for that purpose. OK, let's see. Um, I think the some people seem to have the impression that Creta seems focused on look, looking at um, increases or changes in flood risk as opposed to say, a, a, you know, a typical water supply or water supply re reliability analyses. Is that, a, is that an accurate observation? You know, I would say that most of the case studies to date have actually been more on the water supply side. Um, uh, we're trying to incorporate flood risks into it as well. Um, and uh, that's been a particular challenge uh, that we've been conquering for the Tuolumne study. Uh, just because I think it's been difficult in the past outside of GCMs to provide a credible link between climate and flooding. Um, but I would say most of the um, most of the uh, the risks that we've analyzed in Creta uh, up until this point have um, the the vulnerabilities have been more associated with drought risks than than flood risks. I, I don't know if you have a, a different perspective on that, uh, John M. I, I I've seen it uh, pretty pretty variable. I mean, like the the Nyester project in U Ukraine Moldova, like that's a that's a huge flood risk uh, issue. Um, and uh, the the Swedish case study is actually about sea level rise and, and coastal inundation uh, issues. That's a series of small communities uh, in, uh, in in Sweden and the the, the uh, changes that they're are already feeling at a at a relatively local level. I think that you know water quality is also uh, uh, a, a very suitable approach and application for uh, for, for for Creta. And of course, I I, I endorse the, the you know its application to uh, aquatic uh, uh, ecological resources uh, and, and management too. And if have uh, I have a forthcoming paper that's looking at water quality and uh, in, in measured by salinity and uh, in ecosystem uh, conditions uh, in the in Great Basin of North America. Well, there are a few questions left. Uh, you guys have already gone on for answering questions for as long as you were presenting. In fact, it's, you're actually answering questions a little bit longer. So, um, I actually think, let me see, there's one more that just came in. Da, 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 da. There's actually, um, let's see, created, no, we always talked about uh, shared vision planning. Um, I am I'm, I am going to send to the two of you, some people have sent around some publications that you may, um, that you may find uh, useful. Uh, in fact, I sent around to the group on online, uh, Steve Burgess up there in Washington, um, commented that infrastructure or uncertainties are large. Infrastructure design and operation has always been done under conditions of uncertainty. And it's important to um, put water into a total societal com uh, context. And he um, mentioned a publication. Again, I sent this around to the group, making climate assessments work, learning from California and other subnational climate assess assessments that was just published by the National Research Council. So uh, you folks want to 
the, those of you who are still listening, we still have 135 people on, might want to take a look at that. And I did send that around to to everybody. Um, the, the the last statement is a, is a, it's actually more of a statement. I think it's from Patty Dillon. I think I'll ask you guys just to respond to it since it's almost 30 minutes past the hour. I think even those with full access to all information and institutional support cannot deliver the right engineering numbers. The uncertainties in any climatic projections are huge. The best engineers can do is provide clear statements and, when applicable, quantitative characterization of the uncertainty associated with projected values. I don't know if either one of you wants to comment in that or we'll we'll just kind of let that go. But Yeah, I'll just say here, here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> here, 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 here. John M., here, here, or... Forget, uh, forget about it. So, anyway. well, I, uh, I, I really uh, like like that sentiment. Uh, you know, I like the definition of uh, that I've I've heard a number of times of deep uncertainty, which is the uncertainties are so large uh, now because of climate change that we can't even uh, distinguish between the credibility uh, based on GCMs anyway uh, uh, between the uh, between alternative uh, interventions that they they're basically all equal. And that is a difference uh, in, in, in the types of uncertainties that, that, that we face, as opposed to what we thought that we faced in, in the past. I think we've gotten good as, a, as, as the water community of coping with uncertainty, but this is a new type of uncertainty. And, we, and we're just now, I think, starting to, uh, to adequately come to grips uh, with, with that. Okay. Um I think we're done here. I've got 30 minutes past the hour. John M., you're probably dying to get some dinner since it's, what, 8.30 p.m. your time in uh, in Ljubljana. And um, John K., you're probably ready to go to lunch. Um, I've never seen anything like this. I mean, the people are still asking questions. There's still 125 people online. And um, I've got four or five pages of questions on a uh, on, a, on a, a Word document. So anyway, I want to thank the two of you. Um, and uh, I've never seen a response like this, and um, excellent presentation. I want to thank all the people who have tuned in and who have listened and who have asked some wonderful questions. If I missed your questions, I apologize. I tried to pick some ones that seemed to be a little more general, And but don't forget, in um, in 10 days or so, those of you who are registered for the webinar, you're going to have complete access to everything, the this entire um, hour and a half, you'll get all the questions and responses and the PDFs and all that. So, so John Matthews and John Kacharski, I want to thank you both. Um, this has really been a great and a very auspicious start to our 2019 webinar season. So thanks a lot, guys. My pleasure. Thank, thank you, Mike. Thanks to AWRA too. Thank you very much. Okay, and to all of you still listening. Um, Really appreciate it. Hope to see you again soon. So have a good rest of the day or rest of the evening. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.